Welcome to the Physique Development Podcast. I am joined by the amazing Coach Charlotte, and we are going to give you guys an inside look of what training intensity really means and getting to training failure. We even tell a little bit of a story of where <laughs> Charlotte almost threw up on the leg extension. Before we get into the episode, subscribe to the channel, give us a thumbs up, and leave us a comment, and we'll see you on the inside. Charlotte, you and I yesterday were having a meeting and uh, you expressed your desire for a, a home gym. Yes, I am very excited about the prospect of this. I've spent probably more time in the last 24 hours <laughs> since our meeting working on this than I should have, but it's just, it's a fun prospect. Yes. Looking at all the equipment, scoping out the space. It's kind of like a fun game of Tetris. Like I don't have a whole ton of space. I think I did the math and I want to say it was like 192 square feet, really, really, really small space, but you can fit more down there than you'd think you can. Yeah. My eight foot ceilings, seven foot ceilings are going to be a little bit of a task, but honestly, there's been some equipment that, that should fit. What's the, what's the thing that makes you the most excited about a home gym? Oh gosh, not having to commute to the gym, not having to commute to the gym. That is something that has really been my driving factor. Just making it so that it's super easy to get my sessions in no matter what. I would love to be able to film some content at home super, super easily. Filming content in a, my gym's not like a commercial gym. I work out at a smaller local gym owned by, you know, some local people, really, really awesome equipment, great environment, but it is still busy. There's trainers in there with their clients all the time. So filming content around that can be a little difficult. I like to be respectful of people and their clients, not wanting to like, you know, get too many people in the background. So it gets a little tricky. So that's a big driving factor. And also, yeah, just not having to commute, especially like the weather is getting colder. And I'm like, <laughs> do I really want to drive 15 minutes to yeah. the gym? No, no, I don't. I'm going to do it, but I don't really want to. It, it's just, <laughs> it's how long is your commute? It's 15 minutes. Oh, 15 minutes. It's not terrible. <laughs> no, it's not. My old gym was Mm, I want to say 2025, which honestly still was not that bad. Like I really cannot complain. And I've had access to like the best gyms in the state, minus your home gym. Yeah. <laughs> um, and even that I technically still kind of have access to. Um, so, you know, three best gyms in the state right in my backyard. Um, but yeah, it's it's just, you know, it, it's, a, it's a 30 minutes of your day that like I just don't want to have to spend. And I mean, honestly, like the thought of being able to like bring my dogs down with me <laughs> and not having to worry about them, especially like right now with Pablo's foot all messed up. But anyway, yeah. that's a conversation for another day. Um, yeah, a lot of driving factors. The costs, a little expensive, but it would be a good investment for the long run. Like, it's not like it would expire. It's not like it would, you know, I wouldn't, I would be able to use it for forever, especially if I get good quality pieces. Right. And, and it's a greater investment for you just mm -hmm. in the sense that you can make the content Absolutely. and those different things. So yeah. yeah, it's, I mean, I, we get comments on different videos for our home gym of, of like, this is way more expensive than you could have like 10 gym memberships and it still would be cheaper. It's like the value that we've gotten out of it for all the educational content we've done and saving me time and, and peace of mind. Like last night I trained at 8 PM. I can assure you that I would not have driven to go to the closest gym here would be 20, 25 minutes. I probably would have not made that drive out there to train and then drive all the way back in that instance where I just had to put my shoes on and I just went out there and was like, I'm going to just sit out there and turn on the music, move my body a little bit. And if I get going, I'll train. If I don't, it is what it is. I'll stretch. And I ended up having a really good session. And so it it's a huge you least benefit. Expect it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. I love that. And I love the five minute rule too. Like I'm going to try, I'm going to go for five minutes and yeah. it still feels like it's not happening after five minutes. We'll call it for the day, but at least I'll kind of get that blood flowing and get, get moving in that direction. <laughs> yes. One of the, one of the things that I have found to be somewhat challenging as we've transition to the home gym is training to failure. And that's really going to be our topic for today and getting into the nuts and bolts of the value of what failure training uh, can be, as well as what failure training really is. Because oftentimes individuals have a misconception of what that is relative to what they've seen in the gym or what they've accomplished for themselves. So how would you define training to failure? There's so many different definitions of training to failure already. My brain is going in several different directions. But if we're talking about just training to failure in a very, very basic sense, we are talking about when you get to the end of your set, you finish your set, you are at a place where you cannot complete another rep with the same or very, 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 very similar form to the prior rep that you have just performed. If you're starting to break down to a good degree, if you're starting to, you know, wobble all over the place, if you're, you know, things are slipping out of your hand, that's where we're starting to get to a point where, all right, not sure if this set is going to continue being super, super productive beyond that point. That's when we're hitting that, that failure point. 
Awesome. And so actually something that I'd want to say before we get into failure training is that it's important to emphasize training with intention. Because I think that training with intention needs to be the focus first and foremost before someone gets to a place of training to failure. And with training to intention, training to intention is simply understanding what the goal of your training stimulus is, as well as focusing on the form and having good intensity to the training. Not necessarily taking it to failure, but to a close degree of failure, um, as well as having a, a game plan that you're following, not just going in haphazardly of like, I'm training back and biceps today, like having a, a real goal. And so training with intention is the most important thing. And then once you have that under your belt, then training to failure is going to be a helpful piece to you achieving the greatest degree of hypertrophy that we can or seeing the body composition improvements and um, improvements in muscle density that we want to see. So I think that we can dig into the different types of failure. Because as you said, there's a lot of different types of failure that people can experience. And the first one is going to be psychological failure, which is the one that everyone experiences to some degree. Do you want to define that for us? Yeah. So when we're talking about psychological failure, this is something that people experience from really even your first very basic beginning days of the gym, even if you don't even necessarily realize it. But this is kind of what happens when you finish a set before you really get to that you know, true failure point, your kind of brain starts to take over. It's kind of a protective mechanism of, oh, I'm kind of reaching that point where it's getting difficult. I'm feeling, you know, some pain. It's starting to feel a little bit difficult. And that's kind of where the majority of people, especially before they really start to understand what failure looks and feel like, that's where most people kind of tap out. And really, like like we said, that's you're not truly reaching failure at that point. That is just really your brain kind of saying, okay, I'm getting a little bit scared. I, I have some, some red flags or maybe yellow flags going up of, all right, this is getting a little bit tricky. And that is where a lot of people really have to learn and really learn how to apply themselves to really, like Alex was saying, train with true intention to really be able to get themselves past that point. Because yes, it's hard, but just stopping because it's hard is not really going to get you where you want it, where you want to go. Yeah. And, and I think within uh, psychological failure, oftentimes people will stop here because they do not have the confidence in their exercise execution. They don't know if they're doing the exercise properly or they haven't been you know, shown how to really get to a place of failure. And uh, oftentimes when individuals get into training and they haven't had time with uh, training uh, in a team environment or with a personal trainer, they got into the gym because they were following someone on social media and they wanted to change their life, which is amazing, but they don't have the repetitions to understand like really what that intensity threshold is outside of what they've seen on social media, which the person that they're following on social media may not showcase real sets to what that failure really means to them or what it can be within their training. No, that's such a good point because like you said, you know, a lot sometimes people don't really show that because it's not it's it's not going to look cute necessarily, especially, you know, a lot of women are cognizant of the image they put forward whether it be in social media and or in life and you know, some people may not be, but it is something that you see in in the gym and in, in in life. And again, training to failure, it's not necessarily always going to be a cute process. You're going to make some faces. You're probably going to make some noises. It's going to sound a little animalistic, potentially, <laughs> for lack of a better term. And you have to really learn how to apply yourself and how to get as much as you can out of those sets. And it does take reps. Like Alex was saying, it does take practice. You're not necessarily going to get there right away. I know I did not get there right away. I know I like had points when I thought that I was training to failure, but it was kind of that point of, oh, my brain was giving up before my body was. And it does take learning what that point actually feels like and understanding that threshold for you personally. Yes. And, and it's going to take time. Like you're not going to go into the gym the first time and be like, I know exactly yeah. <laughs> what the threshold for training to failure really is for me. Like it's just going to take time. And so if you're early in the stages of your resistance training and uh, you're trying to find that, just keep working at it and keep taking log of it because tracking it is going to be the most important thing of, of where you're at each week and, and making sure you're increasing load and those different factors. Yep. Data is one of the most helpful things in this in this, as, in this aspect, I would have to say, whether it be, you know, even video can be really helpful in this aspect, but that's, you know, even more helpful when it gets a little bit further down too. Yeah. The, the next one is going to be systemic or cardiovascular failure, where this is the heart and lungs become too taxed and the blood is filled with far too much waste product and the body starts to, and I'm going to use this loosely, but the body starts to shut down. I think that the easiest reference point for this is that, and I'm using this because this is semi-recent for me, <laughs> is that um, about seven or eight months ago, I ran a mile continuously for the first time Crushed in a long it. time. I was weighing about 232 pounds at that time. I could not believe 
how much my lungs were burning, how bad my joints felt, and my body felt as though it was shutting down because there was far too much waste product in my blood as well as my lungs and my heart were far too taxed because I was trying to run at the speed in which I would have ran 10 years ago, you know, whatever the case may be. (laughs) Not going to work. And that was the turning point for me to say, listen, fatty, (laughs) you have got to get back into running shape because this is embarrassing. You are educating far too many people on how they should take care of their health and wellness. And this is how you're running. This is embarrassing. (laughs) We've come a long way since then, though. (laughs) Yes, I've come a long way since then. But that's my greatest reference point for what this is. And so when you're seeing this within your resistance training, this is going to be something where you get above repetitions, maybe 12 to 15. And you start to feel tax through your lungs and and through your heart. And that's, you're not getting the local muscular failure that we're wanting to see within hypertrophy goals. And so you are reaching a point in failure, but not getting to a point where we're going to reap the benefit from a hypertrophy standpoint. And so is there anything that you want to add to that particular type of failure? Um, Not necessarily. Uh, Like you said, it is going to occur at those higher rep ranges in the majority of people. And in some cases, if you are somebody who is more cardiovascularly conditioned, you run a lot, you do a lot of, you know, that type of training, you likely are going to be a little bit better at kind of muscling through that. You may not necessarily be quite as affected by it. Doesn't necessarily mean that it can't happen to you, but you may have a little bit of a higher tolerance of this. So this could potentially work to your advantage to a little bit of a degree, but you also may need to use a little bit of a different load as a result of it. So something to kind of keep in mind if you're Again, somebody who's relatively conditioned, again, you don't, uh, you do a lot of running, you may not necessarily experience this quite as often, but it can sometimes happen. So just something to kind of be mindful of. You can, you know, if you're kind of general population, things like, you know, losing body fat, improving your body composition, going to help you get to a better place with this, put your body in a better position to uh, muscle through some of that and just become more efficient in this specific uh, system. Sure. And I I think with endurance-based athletes who come to me wanting to gain muscle, increase their hypertrophy as a whole. Um, They want to rely very heavily on these higher rep ranges. Like, this is what I enjoy. This is what I'm good at. It's like, we all want to do things that we're good at. We don't want to do things that we're not good at, of course. And the the benefit or the uh, opportunity to actually gain muscle tissue is going to come at some of those lower rep ranges, potentially with a greater intensity of of, uh, training that you're implementing. So that's one tidbit that I'd add there. The, The next is the uh, local muscular failure. Do you have any tidbits there? Yes. So when we are talking about local muscular failure, this is going to be something where the the cardiovascular component, the psychological or the brain component isn't necessarily going to be quite as prevalent here. This is going to be more where the muscle itself and some of the surrounding muscle is not necessarily going to be able to produce enough force to continue doing reps. So this is going to be where we want to be when we're reaching for hypertrophy. So when we are, again, trying to build muscle tissue and we're trying to, you know, really reach that threshold, like you are going to want to understand what this local muscular failure feels like. Now, it's important to keep in mind that with the local muscular failure, you can sometimes have some supporting muscles that may make this a little bit more difficult for you. Alex, do you want to expand a little bit more on that? Sure. Before we, before we dig into that, I think that, um, with us speaking to the local muscular failure, this is what we're wanting to get to. This is the this is the cream of the crop. This is what we're trying to achieve when we are reaching failure for hypertrophy gain. Is there a way that you are working with your clients to best implement this? Let's say that they haven't reached local um, muscular failure before. Is there a way that you're teaching them to get to that point or exercises that you're implementing that, hey, this is a good one for us to try to get to failure so that you can showcase and use this as an example? Yeah, absolutely. When we're talking about this, and especially if somebody is not familiar with failure, things like stability are going to be your best friend. So you're going to want to stick with movements where you're going to be in a very stable environment you can really lock yourself into a position. You're not doing a, you know, barbell back squat, for example, where there's a lot of st- stabilization that has to happen for the movement to be executed well. You want to be in a position where you can kind of lock yourself in, get after it, for lack of a better term, and really just focus on applying yourself to the, you know, up degree for that given set. Something like, like a leg press can be a great place to do that, a leg curl, a leg extension. When we're talking about lower body, some of those more, you know, smaller muscle group type accessory movements in upper body, you know, lateral raises, bicep curls, things Things like that are a great place to really practice that and learn that skill so you can really start to understand kind of what it feels like. Um, like, like we alluded to at the beginning, video is one of my absolute favorite teaching tools when it 
comes to learning what failure both looks and feels like. One of the most useful things a client can do is they send me a video and say, hey, coach, you know, this is a set to failure. Can you tell me, did I actually take this set to failure? What can I do better to take this set to failure? What should I be looking for in that case? And, you know, when you are looking at video, one of the main things to look at is, as we kind of talked about already, is the rep speed and kind of how the reps are looking as those reps start to slow down at the end of that set. That's when we're starting to approach that true, you know, local muscular failure level. If your reps are all looking the exact same, if they're not slowing down a little bit, if that rep velocity is staying identical rep to rep, you're probably not getting super close. So being able to point that out to a client of, yeah, you know, this, we might feel like this set's getting hard, but if we look at your rep speed, it's almost the exact same as it was on that last rep. So we actually still have a little bit more to give there. And it's okay. It takes, just like Alex was saying a few minutes ago, it takes practice. Uh, it's very rare that a client sends a set to failure to me at the beginning and they're like, oh, it's 100% perfect right from the get-go, but that's okay. You know, that's where that opportunity for learning and for growth is really just so plentiful. Um, yeah, I would say that's kind of some great two teaching tools that I've really started to use over the last couple of years. And something to add there is that with breakdown and form, it's going to be kind of a it's going to work on a, a gradient. It's not yep. just like you see a small bit of the exercise being different than what the first rep was. It's like, okay, you have to stop right the second. Mm -hmm. It's like, there's some things that can start to be a little bit less stable, if you will, that can, we can still push through. It's not like we have to end as soon as it's not crystal clear, perfect. There's going to be a little bit of a window there. Um, and we, maybe we can expand on that. Or if you guys would like to see a, a video of, of greater detail on different exercises, that may be a useful tool uh, for everyone. Now, Getting to the next question that you had, speaking to the support muscle groups potentially being a hindrance in uh, achieving that local muscular failure. So we think of exercises like rows or RDLs where uh, we are depending very heavily on our grip to be able to train, whether that be our glutes and our hamstrings in the RDL, or it be the lats or the upper back when we're doing row variations. And so with that dependence on the forearms, we may find ourselves in a situation where the forearms are getting uh, to a state of fatigue before the lats or the glutes or the hamstrings do. And so we want to ensure that we are giving ourselves a tool like wrist straps or like versa grips um, to not allow for that to be the case, that we can get to that level of hypertrophy that we're wanting to achieve within those intended muscle groups. And especially with a majority of our clients wanting to see glute and hamstring growth, this is a game changer that I see within so many of our clients when they're not utilizing them. And they're like, I'm just not seeing the same progress, especially within these heavier hinging movements. And then as soon as they start to implement it, it's like, oh, I had three or four more reps beyond what I was like what I was doing before. And it's like, so you were actually at an RPE of like six, maybe seven before each and every set you were like, oh, I was failure. I couldn't do one more. And so then that really clicks for a lot of people of even though Versa Grips are somewhat expensive. They're continuing to get more expensive. So you might as well buy them today because they last forever and just take care of them. Because when I got my pair, I think they were 50 bucks and I got a pair for a client the other day or I was getting a link for him and they're $85 now, yeah. I think, or 80 or 85 bucks. I and had I was mine like, on sale a few years ago. I don't know if they even run sales anymore. <laughs> I don't know why they would. They're the best. I know. So like, I was so lucky. I was them. like, sale. Check. Check out now. <laughs> yeah. So grab the Versa grips and, and and wrist straps are fine. I think. Do you use Versa? Are you I use, use Versa grips? Versa yeah, grip. okay. I've used the Versa grip pros. I've had them since I think twenty nineteen or twenty twenty at this point. Since I started working with Sue. Okay, so I've had I've had three pairs over the last twelve years. The first pair. I used until the wheels fell off. The second pair I lost, and this third pair um, I've had for maybe four or five years, and it's in great. Con they're in great condition. I, I'm probably going to use them for another two or three years at least. Yeah, and mine so, are perfect. Literally, yeah. look like they. I mean, they're a little dirty, a little you know, have definitely <laughs> got some sweat stains on them at this point, but they're in great condition. I mean, I'm in no no real risk of needing new ones anytime soon. So highly recommend. Great investment, especially if you're spending money on other stuff in your fitness journey. Like, quit fooling yourself and spend seventy dollars on the Versa grips. They're going to last you forever, and you're going to get way more out of them than any sort of most supplements and other stuff. Yeah. Skip out on the greens powder yes. for one month and, and get yourself exactly. the Versa Grips. <laughs> and I wish that this was paid. I wish that, right? I wish I could tell you sponsored by Versa Grips, but that is not true. We have reached out to them so many times <laughs> and they are not interested. <laughs> Maybe they, after seeing I don't this. Think they do sponsorships. No, do they don't do any sponsorships. Dang. I met them at the Dallas Europa maybe seven years ago. It's, it is family owned. It's this like it's two. It's an older husband and wife, at least from, you know, that long ago. I assume it's still the same people. And they had like no interest in advertising. They were just like, we're the best product and we're just going to. I mean, 
more they're power right. to them. They're right. But I mean, I'm just wondering, like, if they had gone with you guys seven years ago, imagine how many thousands of pairs of VersaGrip they would have <laughs> sold and how much they would have prospered by now had they just said yes. I missed opportunity. I couldn't agree more. Um, <laughs> and hopefully they see this <laughs> and change their mind. Everybody at VersaGrips in the comments. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the other movement that I wanted to make a note of, because oftentimes people only think of the the local muscle not getting to uh, failure because of RDLs or rows, but this can also be within pressing motions. And so we think of like an overhead press or a, a flat dumbbell or incline press. We can be in a scenario where we're pressing through and we get to a sticking point about halfway through the repetition or to the upper third and find ourselves in a place where we can't extend our arms more. And maybe someone with Think, okay, I've reached failure and I no longer, I'm going to rack the weight. But you would ha still have the ability to complete more repetitions through your chest or through your anterior delt potentially by continuing to have a good spotter. And that's where having a great spotter is a awesome, awesome, awesome thing. Now, not all of us have an amazing spotter. No, I'm not that <laughs> fortunate, unfortunately. I am fortunate when I uh, time it well that Sue and I are in the gym or if I get a chance to train with Miguel. <laughs> and so I, every blessed, 100 blessed. sessions <laughs> have a good spot. Um, it would, it would make more sense for all three of our trainings to try and line it up <laughs> so that we can get the most out of our training. But we why have, would, why would we bring logic into you this? You know what? We're, we're completing year two of all being together this frequently and still haven't figured it out. Year three is the time. Logic comes <laughs> <in> year three. <laughs> we're going to figure it out. <laughs> but that, the pressing motions were a another one um, that uh, could be a hindrance to reaching that local muscular failure. For sure. The triceps are a big, big one that I feel like I've honestly been struggling with a lot with my bench press. But we're doing some close grip and it's getting better. Yeah, strengthening those yeah, triceps. Getting there. I, on a side note here, I think that the JM press phenomenal. Okay. I've had great results with strengthening my triceps through this exercise and using the easy bar. We have like a, in the, in our garage, we have the, like a plate loaded easy bar instead of just like the, the know, preloaded ones, ones yeah. um, which is nice. Mm -hmm. And while you're here, maybe we go out there and play with it a little bit, yeah. but Good to know. I, I have enjoyed that. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Okay, the last, well, yeah, this is kind of the last form of, of failure that we'll talk about, but this is, is technical failure. And this is when you fail the exercise without sacrificing your form, which is going to be in alignment with that most local muscular failure. They're, they're basically one in the same, um, but I wanted to highlight the technical failure because this is really the thing that we're pushing for within the training. And there are subtypes to technical failure. And the first one that we're going to want to cover here is going to be concentric failure. And what happens when you reach concentric can failure Con Whoa. And what happens when you reach concentric failure is you are trying to complete the concentric point of the movement or the shortening portion of the movement, but you're not able to get there. You hit kind of a sticking point, basically. This happens pretty often, especially if you're pushing to a high degree of intensity within the gym, but it, it can feel a little uncomfortable if you're not super comfortable, if you're not familiar with it. Yeah. Think about when you're doing a, a dumbbell bench press and you're getting about halfway there and you start to kind of shake a little bit and it starts to really be slow, but you can keep grinding it out. That would be nearing that concentric failure, this is where having a spotter and some of these different movements is going to be helpful. With my queen of my grindy reps. <laughs> yeah. Anyone who watches my Instagram contest is going to be like, oh yeah, that's what Charlotte does all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so getting to this concentric failure is if we're going to use any of these subtypes that we're about to go over, the concentric failure is going to be the one that you're going to utilize probably the most of the three. Uh, it is going to be a little bit more taxing on the central nervous system. So you are going to be ramping that up a little bit. And we'll talk more about how to kind of balance taxing the central nervous system as well as getting to that muscular failure because there is a balancing act to it all where if we're taxing the central nervous system so abundantly and, and just thrashing ourselves, we're not going to get the muscular failure that we need to have because we're so taxed and it's like, dude, I got to go. I got to go home. I can't even, I can't even think straight right now. I'm going to throw up, blah, 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 blah. And so we're trying to avoid those different yes. things happening. And when we're getting Nothing to this- Nothing productive is happening when you're getting <laughs> to that point. Nothing, your, your effective reps are limited. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so the concentric failure is going to be one that you can utilize. You don't want to do it every single set. No. You're not going to be 
able to do it every no, single set. No, oh my set. gosh, no. Yeah, you'll want to maybe, if you're utilizing it, you may reach it one or maybe two times in a training session, especially when you are with a training partner. I want to really reiterate with a training partner. The next is going to be isometric failure. Now, this is one, like I said, is we're not going to use a ton where if you were to be completing a rep, let's go back to the dumbbell bench press and we're just holding the weight at the top and we're just squeezing as hard as we can. It's going to ramp up the central nervous system demand and be very taxing, but it is not going to increase the muscular failure that we're going to be accomplishing. And so the isometric holds or the isometric failure is not going to be a real useful tool in your hypertrophy pursuit. And the last one is going to be eccentric failure. Now, this is the one that is one, probably the least safe option of all these different ones, because you're going to lose control of the weight that you are um, holding. So we can use a bicep curl, for example. This is probably the safest version of this, where as you are to lower the weight, you just finished a repetition. The, the dumbbell is closest to your face that it's going to be throughout the entire rep. You're starting to lower the weight and then all of a sudden your arm just flies. That's going to be a situation where you have reached eccentric failure. Your muscle can no longer hold on to that weight. We do not need this because this is not going to impact a greater amount of muscular failure, but it is going to 1000% raise the central nervous system demand and is going to take away the uh, later set or take away from the sets that would follow that particular set that was performed. And so you're better off, instead of going buck wild and going to that eccentric failure, you're better off going to the mechanical or technical failure for two sets and getting to that point relative to having the one all out go crazy set, which is gonna lead me to the one type of failure that I would never recommend, which is going to be, what did I, what did I uh, Absolute label Absolute failure. Absolute failure. All or nothing, go for all, go <laughs> for broke. Go for everything, <laughs> leaving nothing on the, in the tank, nothing on the machine, whatever you, you wanna call it. use every muscle group that you have in your entire body to move a, a dumbbell and a bicep curl, you are doing the, the wiggle dance as you're lifting the barbell for a deadlift. Those types of failure where you're taking every muscle in your body to move the, the weight from point A to point B, that's the failure that we're not going to be implementing. One, this is going to be a much greater risk of, of, of injury. It's also going to be a much greater risk of you ending your session early mm -hmm. because you're, you're going you're done to, for. exactly. <laughs> you're just going to stare into the abyss and be like, Oh, I think I was working out. <laughs> the rest of your session is not going to be helpful for you. <laughs> your best use of your time is going home and taking some rest. <laughs> yeah. You're just going to go home and lay on the couch, which I will say early in my training career, I had many sets that I would try to take to this point because I had no, I did not know better, but you have this video, you have That's this podcast. Exactly. <laughs> Listen to us. Don't, don't make the same don't mistakes. Don't learn, don't make the same mistakes we did. I would take, I, this is when I was still living at my parents' house. We would go and train like animals at the gym, take way too much pre-workout, <laughs> Jack 3D specifically. And we would 500 do- 500 milligrams of caffeine. Oh yeah. Pl plus whatever, th three dimethyl or whatever that drug was. <laughs> Smelling salts. Banned. <laughs> <laughs> and we would squat literally till our nose bled. I mean, it was insanity. Fun insanity. Did you grow? I don't think so. Exactly. <laughs> 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 muscularly did not grow. Did I grow mentally? Was I hmm. mentally tougher? <laughs> <laughs> There's something to this. <laughs> um, and I would just come home and just stare at the ceiling and lay on my parents' couch and and just not even know what I was going to do with my life because my brain would no longer function because reaching this absolute failure. It was a demise to my entire day. So don't do this. Mom's it's not like, worth Alex, it. Alex, take out the trash. You're like, what's the trash? <laughs> You're trash, mom. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You are trash after that training session. <laughs> I am trash, actually. Yep. <laughs> I just put myself in the trash can. Superb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, training to absolute failure, there's just no need for it. You'll sometimes see that on like, I feel like those gym fail TikToks and things like that. So I feel like it is, I don't want to say that it's gaining popularity because I do think that there is more education that this is not what you need to be doing with training, but you do still see it sometimes. And even in just, you know, your gym working out just on your own, like you may see people who don't know any better around you. And I'm not saying go and like call them out or anything like that. That's, that's not the culture that we're building here, but just knowing for yourself that that is not that is not needed. The injury risk that comes from that, the fatigue risk that comes from like we've been alluding to, the joint risk, the joint pain, it's just so much more risk than there is reward in that situation. Yes. So 
as we've gone through all the definitions, I think now we can kind of dig into why why is this beneficial, which we've kind of talked through throughout the uh, definitions, but what do you see as the most beneficial part to utilizing failure within resistance training for your clients? Um, I'll take a little bit more of a personal approach kind of to start, and then I'll kind of tangent from there. But for me personally, training to failure has honestly like transformed my perception of myself, which seems maybe a little dramatic to some, but when you are somebody who chases smallness and you chase less and things like that for a number of time, asking more of yourself and asking what am I truly capable of, when that switch flips, there's just something like truly magical that happens in your brain, like the the self-confidence that comes from that, the self-belief, which are similar. But, you know, when you learn what you're capable of in a gym setting, I firmly, firmly, firmly believe in anyone who's followed me and has heard me speak before knows this. I firmly believe it carries over into the world outside of it. You know, if you can go into the gym and you can pick up heavy weight and you feel confident and like a badass doing that, I mean, that's not to say that you're necessarily going to always be able to apply that in every life circumstance, but it becomes a heck of a lot easier to believe in yourself in other ways outside of the gym. And I know that's very much what I have noticed in myself and something that I see all the time in clients and really just clients understanding what they're truly capable of. Like so many times clients come to me and we'll kind of add in those sets to failure, kind of start working up over time towards that. And they go, wow, I never knew that I could lift this much weight. I never knew that I could do this. I never knew that this was possible for me. And just having them have those light bulb moments of, wow, this is possible for me. I am capable, regardless of the hypertrophy benefits of which there are, you know, a number of that we'll get into, of course. But the mental benefits, I feel like, are really, really overlooked, especially when we talk about literature and science and research and things like that. That's a whole conversation for another day that you're never going to be able, you're never going to be able to really adequately grasp the mental aspect. So I know that's a little bit of a personal tangent, but that's something that I truly believe, not just women, everybody, every single human being on this planet can benefit from in a really, really, really big way. That's my personal belief anyway. No, I, I can agree. I think it is something you don't have as many opportunities to overcome an obstacle. Absolutely as you do in the gym. Mm -hmm. And so the gym allows for you to have these repetitions in which you're like, okay, I don't believe I can do this. And then you go into it and you, you prove to yourself that you do. And then you start to just build self-confidence of like, I didn't think I was able to do this and I did it. And then I went in the, the gym the next day and did it again. And it's like, you just continue to reiterate, you are capable much more than what an individual may that doesn't go to the gym because they just don't have the opportunity to present themselves with a physical thing, overcome it right in the instantaneous moment, and then repetitively do that. It's like you don't have outside of you have instances where maybe school can kind of reinforce that through, um, you know, different work. But the gym is a really awesome place to get over it because also you have fear, you have a lot of different emotions that you're working through and then proving that to yourself that you can overcome it is really special. Absolutely. And yeah, you mean you said school as an example. I think that's absolutely true. But even with school, I feel like there's kind of a like ceiling of it almost sure. like you kind of get to a point and it's like, okay, well, you know, I can only write so many more papers. I can only do so many more things. And I mean, you know, academic research and things like that obviously kind of expand on that. But the gym, like, there's always more. Like, yeah. there's literally always more, whether it be, you know, I can do this one thing a little bit better. And I mean, that doesn't necessarily apply to failure. But I think, like you said, there's so many opportunities and just exposures of I can be better today than I was yesterday. And you don't get those opportunities in other aspects. And I think the gym is just a beautiful place to really pursue that. And it's really given me a lot in that aspect. But then we kind of go into the hypertrophy aspect of things, which I think is probably what people care a little bit more about. No, I think they care about both, for sure. <laughs> probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think there's a lot of misconceptions about this. And, you you know, training to failure is something that is so, so, so helpful when it comes to ensuring that you are training with a degree of intensity and agree, a degree of intention. Because if you're pushing, if you are going into a session and you're going into a set to failure, you have to really be on. Like you can't be kind of like willy nilly, your brain in a million other places. You really have to be focused. And that is one place where it's, again, a really great opportunity of really giving, giving yourself that opportunity to apply that intensity and that intention to your training sessions. And then also, of course, creating that damage at a tissue level, that micro trauma at a tissue level that is necessary to actually induce the hypertrophy in the long run, like getting to that failure point, getting to that local muscular failure we, that is necessary to grow that tissue. And if and get, training to failure is a really great way to kind of show yourself of, okay, I am really, really engaging that tissue. I am getting to that point of bringing that intensity and really creating that micro trauma. Sure. And with the the most recent research for the hyper, or well, just for 
assessing overall intensity, people self-reporting their intensity. I believe, and and I made a post about this when the paper was originally published, but off the top of my head, I want to say it was like 70% of people miss um reported what their intensity actually was, like mm-hmm. what they were saying their RPE was, then they went in and actually tested it again. And mm-hmm. it was like four or five reps short of what they were saying. Mm-hmm. And so with the literature, it's it's something where we want to be in a close proximity to failure and reaching that technical failure from time to time, kind of touching that um, is a helpful tool. Mm-hmm. And the the getting that close proximity to failure on a consistent basis is not easy. You have to have the intention. You have to have the focus in the gym to be able to get to that point. You're not just going to haphazardly reach that of like, I picked out a random weight and I did the amount of reps that were on paper. It's like if you, and, and a good test for yourself, and this is something that I use with clients as well, is that if you have 10 repetitions on uh, your training and you're feeling as though that you don't have a good gauge of where your reporting is for your RPE, take what you think you were doing for a set of 10 and then give yourself the whatever the score was for that last set. Go through another set and go to complete failure, like really push yourself to get to that point. And let's say that you reported a seven for your RPE for the set prior, and then you went and did 13 reps, the one that you went to failure. You were spot on for your set of RPE of seven for that set prior. But if you were to do 15, 17, 18, even above that, it's like you are very very misreporting. And so it's a good kind of reference point of, eh, do I trust myself here? Okay, let's see where I get to and and those different factors. So failure is going to be a helpful tool, not only to strengthen your self-confidence, to improve um, your mental toughness, these different things that we're all going to benefit outside of the gym, which is amazing. But it's also going to help with the body composition goals that you have, as well as achieving the hypertrophy um, that you're wanting to achieve. Absolutely. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled. And I look forward to speaking with you. As you're working with your clients, what are some of the prerequisites that you have to have in place as you are teaching them to train to failure or train at a high intensity? One of the biggest prerequisites, and I feel like this is going to apply to everybody, and is just a really solid understanding of exercise execution and your own body and kind of how different movements work. Having that really solid foundation of execution is paramount because if you don't have that solid base of execution within movements, you aren't able to adequately determine when that execution point, when that breakdown of execution really starts to begin, it becomes a little bit more difficult to do that. And you're already, or if your execution isn't in a solid place to begin with, you're not in a position where you really can get anything out of that set to failure anyway, because you're already in a compromising position. Um, Another thing is I really, really, really love when a client has a foundation of sending videos in regularly and recording videos. I feel like we've mentioned that a couple of times already, but it is truly, truly, truly so important because failure is so, it's not that it's necessarily subjective, but your how you feel failure is going to feel very different depending on the individual. So how you may be experiencing failure, just like we've talked about already, the different types of failure, you may be experiencing that psychological failure and thinking that it's that true muscular failure. But if I see that set in that video and I'm like, oh, no, 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 we're not at that true muscular failure yet. So having those videos in place and having a good cadence with that is super, super helpful. That's something that I've gotten so much value out of in myself and even just really being honest with myself of being like, oh, wow, I'm like, I thought that that set was to failure, but I watch it back and I'm like, oh, damn, maybe I had a little bit more left in the tank. (laughs) So that's a little bit tough. And then obviously a foundation of recovery. When you are pushing to failure and you're starting to really amp up that intensity, recovery is paramount. You have to be prioritizing recovery. You have to be eating enough food. You have to be sleeping enough. You have to be supporting yourself, managing your stress. Because if you are just adding on sets to failure, which are very, very, very stressful and tough on the system, if you're just adding those in willy-nilly and you don't have those recovery inputs in the right place, you are going to be spinning your wheels and you are not going to be accelerating or putting yourself in a better place to get results. So that recovery basis is incredibly, incredibly important. And you have to have that in place before we can really ramp that up and really apply yourself and push things to the next level. Yeah. I I think the videos is such a huge piece. Like not having the videos makes programming very difficult. Mm -hmm. If you don't know where that person's at within their the intensity that they're training at or what, like they can self-report mm-hmm. as best as they can. But the reality is, is that those videos give us 
true clarity of where that's at. And so there will be clients and, and we can kind of talk about this of how many failure sets per week or, or different tools that we kind of go along with. But I will say that my client, it is a, a wide range depending on where they're at kind of in their intensity journey, if you will. Because if I have a client who's newer to the gym or who hasn't had a whole lot of, of time in the gym as a whole, I may have more failure sets programmed because their failure is really just trying to push through the psychological yep. part. So they may have more sets. If you looked at it on paper, like, oh my gosh, that's too many sets to failure. Well, that person is not really taking it to the failure that you're thinking of. Yep. They're taking it to the failure that they think of, and it's not to the threshold that needs to be. And so we have to go there more often to try and break through that. And then as they break through that, they'll see their failure sets start to go down. But it's going to be it's a push and pull with the, the programming because I know where that person's at. If I don't have the videos to assess what they believe failure is, I'm, I'm shooting. I mean, I have no idea. Like it's, it's going to be, I can use like the textbook answer of this is a, how many failure sets we should use from a week to week perspective. But the reality is, is that we just have no idea if we're not seeing the videos. So it is so, so, so important as a client, or if you're a coach yourself to get those videos. And if it's something where I don't know how to get the videos, we'll make a resource. We'll just, we'll make con I've, I've already got it bookmarked. I'll make some content on that. The other thing is, is that if you just don't feel like you feel a little self-conscious in the gym. This is going to be also speaking to the, the self-confidence. This is going to break through that of like, you are, you know, going against the grain a little bit, challenging your fear. And you're going to realize you take that video. It's not as scary as what mm -hmm. you think. There's going to be less people paying attention than what you think. Mm -hmm. And the people that are paying attention or giving you grief about it suck anyway. Yeah. So it <laughs> doesn't matter. And you're going to have a breakthrough at that point as well. So it's just another thing that you can really add to the, add a feather to the cap, if you will, um, when filming your sets. Absolutely. Failure training is kind of just like a who's who of pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone, whether it be, you <laughs> yeah. know, pushing yourself past where you're comfortable or pushing yourself to record a set in the gym when you wouldn't necessarily have the have the balls to do it <laughs> and showing yourself that it's okay though, because truly like when you show yourself that it is okay, like you learn so much because I am going to be able to tell you, okay, when we look back at this video, look for this thing, you can see it too. And then when you are recording things on your own, when you're not working with a coach one day in the future, you can look back at that video and be like, huh, remember that one time Charlotte told me to look for this in the set to failure. It's a great learning opportunity that's going to set you up for the rest of your life and the rest of your training career, not just while you're working with a coach. It's always helpful. And I, truly, you will always learn something. You have in our notes that you need to tell a story about taking your first PD set to failure. So while you're working with Sue, that was your first yeah. moment with PD. You were a client of Sue's prior to becoming an amazing coach for us. Tell us what that first <laughs> experience was of taking a set to failure. So my first program with PD did not have pro uh, failure sets programmed into it. So my first program, I did not take any sets to failure. So I wasn't super familiar with it after my first program. I get into my second program. We have some set failure sets programmed in there. And I've been training for a couple of years and I like to train hard. Sue knows this. So she's kind of giving me the runway to push things a little bit. And I'm excited about this. So I'm like ready to go. And I'm <laughs> I get on the leg press thinking I get on the leg press thinking back. It is now like the world's worst leg press. And I'm like, thank God I don't have to use that leg press regularly. But I like put a couple of plates on there. That's like a set of, I don't know, I think it was like eight to 10 or something like that. I can't remember exactly. But I keep asking myself at the end of every rep, I'm like, all right, do I have one more? Do I have one more? At the end of the set, I have done like 15 <laughs> extra reps that I have programmed and I have failed. I have <laughs> failed really hard and I roll my way up the leg press and I'm like, I like lay there for a minute and I'm like, oh, so that's what failure is like. And I report this back to Sue and she's like, so we think we can increase the weight a little bit, huh? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I think so. Just a little bit. So this was a great learning opportunity. And just like we were kind of talking about earlier, how it's a really great learning opportunity of teaching yourself what you're truly capable of. And Alex was talking about how people often underestimate their true RPE. Well, there's a really great example of underestimating <laughs> your true RPE right there. Because I thought I was like, OK, I'm going to go into this failure set. I'm going to like crush it. And I mean, I mean, that was a good failure set, but it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like 25 reps at the end of it. And it's like, no, 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 no. That set did not get effective until like 15 reps in. So I actually come from the <laughs> other side of the training 
I guess, getting indoctrinated into resistance training. Cause I started with being in football and being sports related. And I've talked a number of times about our strength conditioning coach while I was in high school. Um, and he was very intense still to this day, very intense human. And, um, he would literally, and I'm not joking you now, he's probably going to say this never happened, but whatever. Um, he, we would be in the squat rack and we would be going for reps and he would be behind us spotting or one of, he would be coaching one of our teammates to be spotting us. And he would see us reach that psychological failure. And he'd be like, you are not done. <laughs> you go down again. And we would be in a place where, cause we'd have teammates on the sides mm-hmm. of the, it was the safest environment possible to do this. And this is why he did it. And he's amazing. And, and yeah. So what he would do, he'd be like, you're not done. <laughs> Keep going. One more. And it would be Another like, oh, one. <laughs> I don't have it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And we'd go down and we'd stand back up. Our, my teammate behind me is like literally picking me up. He's like, another one. <laughs> again. Again. And we'd get like five, six, seven more. And he'd be like, I told you. <laughs> you're not done. So that was like my, my origin. So I had to like detrain that mentality. <laughs> And get to a place of like, okay, I don't have to go absolutely insane in here every single time. And you don't need uh, to go beyond absolute I don't need to go, failure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we were on opposite ends there, but I have found my common ground, you know, 14 years later or whatever the time like is. Like we said, it takes practice. That I've been, exactly. Some more than others. <laughs> And uh, by using this episode, you're going to get there faster than what I did. (laughs) Fast track to failure. So we have a a couple of kind of, I don't know if they're necessarily rapid fire Q&As, but we have some questions that I think could be helpful for us to, to navigate through around failure training. Now, when we talk about going to failure, there are going to be exercises that are not a good idea to push yourself to, especially if you are alone. So give me your three worst exercises to take to failure by yourself, and then give me the three best exercises, if there were to be best, but just give me three good ones, I suppose. Three worst ones. I mean, I guess I got to say like your big three, your bench, your squat, your deadlift are probably going to be my number, are, are going to be my number, and then my number one, three, <laughs> my top three. There we go. My top three are probably my my first three choices there. But honestly, I have to say that barbell RDLs are actually pretty high on that list for me too, just because I feel like the stability component of it is something that a lot of people overlook. And that once form starts to break down, people kind of still keep going. And I'm guilty of this myself. I am not leaving myself out of this conversation because I've absolutely been there before. And it just gets to be a little sketchy a little quickly. So just be conscious there. Um, and then as far as safest ones, uh, I think I kind of already alluded to this, but some great places to do this are going to be things like a leg press. Um, I love taking a really tough set of lateral raises, like to the point where you literally can no longer move. That's a really safe bet. You really are, your risk of injury there's pretty low. Um, and then a good leg extension set to failure. A good leg extension set. I, there's just not a whole lot that beats No, it. there's not. I you, you left the N1 practical last year, the day before the last brutal leg day that we that we went through together and the yeah. brutal last leg, the leg extension set to failure. I almost vomited after that. <laughs> I had to walk myself to the bathroom. I think it was Stacy came up to me and she was like, Charlotte, are you okay? And I was laying on the floor and I'm like, I'm not okay. I was okay. Just not immediately afterwards. Yeah. I, they changed the schedule on us. I'm not even going to, you know, whatever. I need to pay better attention, but they changed the schedule <laughs> on us. Um, how do you encourage a client to get comfortable to fail safely? I think one of the best things that can be done is honestly practicing, getting comfortable with what a movement feels like when it fails before it actually fails. So for example, if you want to get comfortable taking a leg press sa- leg press set to failure, get comfortable with what it feels like when the sled kind of comes back at you so that it doesn't completely catch you off guard and doesn't completely surprise you. If you know what to do in that situation, if you're prepared, if you know how to react, you're going to be able to handle that with no problem. Even some of those more difficult movements, like the movements that I said I wouldn't recommend taking to failure, a bench or a squat or something like that. If you have the safeties up, if you have the the catches up, practicing what it feels like when the bar falls on those things and when it hits the safeties, it can just, it builds your confidence in those settings. And this kind of like we were talking about earlier with building confidence and getting more comfortable there, the less scary you can make it for yourself. I don't want to say it becomes more inviting because that sounds ridiculous, but 
it's no longer as intimidating. It's like, oh, okay, I know exactly what I'm going to do there. Um, you know, with I had I, I actually failed a bench press set the other day, and I'm ready to just knock the weights off on either side because it's something that is no problem to me. And people are running over to me in the gym, like trying to save me, and I'm like, I, I got it. It's good. It's good. It's good. But like knowing how to fail if the bar falls down on you and obviously you get to a place where you probably don't want to let that happen but especially if you're not going super heavy you know it, getting comfortable and knowing that what it's what happens when you get to that point it just helps you feel more confident it helps you feel like you know what you're going to do you're not going to be caught off guard you're not going to suddenly do something wrong and scare yourself I, I mean I rode horses for years and this is a weird example but you know, I was never really afraid of falling off of a horse because we practiced falling off. Like, so I knew what to do. I knew how to fall safely. So it's not the exact same situation, but, but but the more that you can show yourself, oh, okay, I'm going to be okay in this situation. You can get comfortable there. The less scary it becomes, the easier it becomes to push yourself to that point. Yeah. I think it's common sense to have an exit plan if you think that you could possibly fail. Like if, if you're going into a set and it's like, I don't know if I'm going to get this, have an idea of if you were to fail, what's the outcome? Absolutely. And then the next question is, can you train to failure when you're training alone? You can. Kind of like I was saying a few seconds ago is if you are comfortable with those movements, you know, like I said, I, I regularly bench press heavy by myself and I am very comfortable with bailing out of those weights. And it's something that I've, again, practiced over time. I have that exit plan. I know what to do next. And again, it just happens. It, it, it comes through reps. It happens through practice. You don't just fall backwards into understanding exactly how to fail a set. I wish. Um, but it is absolutely safe to fail alone. I probably wouldn't go super crazy with, you know, a million attempted one rep maxes with your bench press, especially if you don't have a good safety system in place, that's probably a little bit reckless. But a common misconception is that it's completely unsafe to train to failure by yourself. You can't train to failure if you don't have a spotter. And that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot tell you the last time I trained with another human and I trained to failure in basically every single training session that I do. Yeah. Well, I, if the, I guess the thing to really drive home if you are training by yourself and training to failure is that you just have to be more precise with where the catch bars are at. I've seen far too often, let's say somebody gets in the squat rack and they just leave the catch bars for wherever the person that was prior to them. And they're like, yeah, it'll be fine. It's like, well, if you actually fail, those catch bars may be a little bit too low for you. The only time they change it if it's impeding them to get to the depth that they want to have. And so making sure that the catch bars are at the height that you need them to be, small things like that. If you're in a bench press, similar thing. Those different things are going to be important to pay closer attention to if you're by yourself. Because here's the thing. If I'm home alone and I'm down there in the garage and I was to you know be in a bad spot, I, I have no one to blame but myself at that Absolutely. point. I don't have any, you know, no one's going to come save me. So I've got to be able to think on my feet and, and set myself up for success. Um, the next question, compounds versus accessory movements. Should you only push to failure in one of those types of movements? And is it safe to do either or? Absolutely. I mean, it is safe to do either one. I would say accessory movements err on the side of safer. Your injury risk is generally going to be less or you are not going to have as many joints, as many muscle groups involved. So it's, a again, a really great place to get after it. Kind of like we were talking about earlier, leg extension, lateral raise, bicep curl. You're really not putting yourself in many compromising positions by taking those accessory movements to failure. Compound movements are a place where you might end up in a compromising position a little bit more easily. So I would err on the side of caution there. Like we said, really lean on those safety systems if you have them in place. Like like Alex was saying, don't just leave the squat bars to the side. Some people just, I saw somebody talking about how they don't like having the squat bars up next to them because it makes them feel weird. And I'm like, you know, to each their own. We all have our own preferences <laughs> here. But when we're talking about being safe, if you're failing a compound movement, you really do want to push to that high degree of intensity. Making sure you have that system in place is going to be the safest and the best way to approach that, in my opinion. Yes. I think that with accessory movements or especially bicep and tricep training for me, I am pushing to failure almost every set within bicep and tricep work for the sheer fact of one, I don't have a ton of direct volume to those muscle groups, as well as I'm going like the, the possibility of injury very low. And I'm wanting to get the most out of the few sets that I have throughout the training. And so I generally will take them much, much closer to failure or to failure almost every set when I'm performing them. Is it the right thing? I don't know if it's inherently the right thing, but it is what I do within the training. And if you're like, Hey man, you have good biceps and triceps. 
That's the secret, I suppose. <laughs> and honestly, a lot of the time, I feel like those movements are at the end of a session anyway. Exactly. So it's like, hey, let's just get after it and get as much as we can out of these sets and really to supply ourselves. Now, something we haven't talked a ton about throughout this episode is the differences between shortened biased exercises or lengthened biased exercises. Within those different types of, of movements, we're going to approach failure potentially a little bit differently. Is there any... And I, like I said, we haven't talked a ton about these in the episode, but is there a different approach that you take to either of those types of movements? And if you do, give an example to what the exercise is so that the audience has an idea, but kind of walk through that. I think the most important thing to keep in mind with these movements is they're going to affect the body slightly differently. Those lengthened movements are going to be significantly more taxing in the majority of situations and just a lot tougher on the system. So with those lengthened movements, you can absolutely still push them to failure for sure, but I would just be mindful of it and being careful of kind of where you're failing with those movements. It kind of goes back to what we were saying about the eccentric failure and things like that. You just want to be conscious of that um, and just be mindful of not pushing yourself to the point where that's going to happen unless that's specifically your goal. But again, that kind of goes back to what we were saying about the recovery metrics, making sure the systemic and you know central nervous system component is taken into consideration there. Um, so on the other side of that coin, those shorter position movements, kind of like Alex was talking about, some of those, not necessarily all bicep and tricep movements are shorter position, but a lot of times they air slightly more towards the side of it, especially when we're talking about like a lateral raise or something like that, you know, a tricep push down, things of that nature. Um, so keeping the kind of recovery impact in mind is going to be really the most important thing. And, and when we're talking about kind of applying them differently, was that kind of what you said? How do you apply them differently? Exercise examples. We'll, we'll use the glutes because I know many of you listening are wanting some juicy glutes. So a lengthened biased exercise for the glutes is going to be something like a split squat. And with that split squat, you can probably think of if you take that set to failure, it's going to be very taxing. You're going to be pretty beat up by it. You can put that in comparison to maybe a set that you take to failure in a 45 degree hip extension. Still challenging, still very hard, but you're going to have an easier time recovering from that 45 degree hip extension relative to that split squat. And so you have to kind of weigh the differences in those different exercises if you are going to be writing your program for yourself. Now, as a, a coach and working with physique development, that's going to be taken care of for you through the program design. And, and we'll be teaching on that through the, the check-ins and those different factors. But if you're writing the programming for yourself, understanding the value of the exercises and you taking them to failure is going to weigh differently depending on where the bias is or where the tension is going to be greatest in those particular exercises. Absolutely. Yeah. This is such a good point. And thinking about the, you know, even the assistant muscle groups, the support muscle groups that are secondary muscle groups that are going to be involved in something like a split squat, for example, you're going to have greater, a greater demand is going to be placed on alternate muscle tissue beyond just the target muscle tissue. And that's also going to weigh into or contribute to the demand that is being placed on the system as you're going to failure. So with a split squat, for example, you're going to engage pretty much most of the muscle musculature in the lower body. And, you know, if you're holding the muscle, the dumbbells in your hand, a large degree of the musculature in your upper body, not necessarily like in that they're creating high quality tension in those areas, but they're being they are being called on to stabilize in those movements. So the energy, the you know, energy expenditure that's happening as a result of it, the demand that is being placed in the body, like Alex was saying, it is just going to be significantly greater. So you, just being mindful of we probably don't want to go too overboard with those lengthened sets to failure. It's not that you can't incorporate them. It's a really, really great place to create some really, really, really great quality trauma or tension within the, within the muscle tissue. So, you know, you don't want to neglect it, but just being mindful of the load that is going to place in the body to recover from something like that and then the ability to apply yourself in the rest of your training session. Yeah. Well, this episode was awesome. I've really enjoyed getting to chat with you. Is there anything that you want to leave the listeners with today, like a signing off note? Um, I think one of the most important things when it comes to training to failure, kind of a silly thing, is learning from people who actually are applying themselves to failure sure. and aren't afraid to show it. Like Alex was saying earlier, right when we first got started, you don't necessarily see it in people all the time or they aren't comfortable showcasing that. And, you know, I respect that to each their own. You know, not everybody is into that or wants to do that, but especially if that's something that you are interested in learning more about to really get as much as you can out of your training, really making sure that you are learning from people who showcase this, talk about it regularly, and are going to be kind of good examples in this topic instead of just people who are, 
you know, kind of moving around in the gym, doing whatever. Again, there's nothing wrong with that if that's your goal, but really making sure that the people who are you are listening to and are aligning yourself with are actually in alignment with the goal that you want to pursue. That was something that made a really, really big difference for me and kind of unlocked something for me is realizing, oh, these people over here are doing something different from those people over here. It's not that it's better or worse, but I'm more interested in this over here. So I need to make sure these are the people that I'm learning from, looking up to, and kind of absorbing what they're sharing. So that seems kind of self kind of obvious, I would say, but especially in a world of social media where it's kind of like, oh, like everybody's posting all these stuff about, you know, exercise and things like that. Like if you're really interested in learning about training with intensity and pushing yourself to failure, find people who are willing to share that because I don't want to say that it's vulnerable. It's not that it's necessarily vulnerable, but like I said, you know, you're not necessarily going to look cute there. Like it's, 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 it's tough. So being able to really learn from people who showcase that I think is really helpful. Absolutely. Charlotte's information is going to be in the description. You can find her on Instagram, TikTok, anything like I'm that. I'm not a TikToker. Not a TikToker. I'm not a TikToker. Her Instagram will be below. I'm you fake. Can- <laughs> <laughs> you can you can apply to work with her below if you want to be strong and and have her as your coach. You resonated very heavily throughout this episode. You're like Charlotte is strong. awesome, and I have to work with her. You'll be able to inquire below. Thank you guys so much for listening. Make sure that you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you in the next episode.